everybody, and welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford. I write and talk about all things fitness and outdoors related over on theoutdooredit.com and a bunch of other places, and just started yoga teacher training this weekend. Eee! And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a registered kinesiologist and endurance coach. I'm down at a camp, so you may hear the rustling of North Carolina tall pines, I think is what I'm around, but uh, sort of standing in a forest talking to you right now really thought you were going to say the rustling of like junior racers like foraging for snacks in the wilderness or something did you like to eat a lot i was uh we did a little nutrition talk last night uh using a lot of molly's book fuel your ride sort of topics so that went over moderately well today i got presented with all the fries and pasta and um some ice cream that was also used for lunch and sort of proclaim that they really were listening to the nutrition talk. So. Oh boy. Well, yeah. you have your you have your work cut out for you. Now, we'll have to catch back up later about everything that's going on, how yoga teacher training is going for me after weekend one, how your camp is going. Uh, but I know you're short on time because you're at the camp. And frankly, I need to get a bunch of stuff done so I can go to bed early tonight because I promised someone I would get up for a 6 a.m. swim tomorrow. So it's pretty perfect that today's episode is all about swimming. Yeah, we have Sheila Tarmina, and she wrote a book that really, really influenced uh, the sort of latter part of my Ironman preparation. It sort of added the speed. Once I got comfortable with total immersion, which we've, we've had Terry on from total immersion, um, I needed to add some speed. And so she was, you know, a, a, her book was really, really good. And she's a tremendous interview. I had a great time talking to her. Uh, some really actionable steps. So the couple of requests we've had for a swim sort of specialist, none of this triathlon swimming or whatever. Um, she's amazing. She's a consummate athlete as well. Uh, we talk about sort of the multiple Olympics and high end performance she's had uh, in swimming, but then also she moved on and did triathlon and then also did the pentathlon. Uh, so my mind was just blown for a while uh, early in the interview. And then I fully got myself together <laughs> uh, and yeah, just some really good, really good practical drills. And she, we talk about flip turning as well, uh, which was fairly elementary, I think, for what she's used to doing. But she humored me and sort of gave me some tips on how to sort of confront that because I didn't really deal with it. Nice. So, yeah, I, I'm, I think you guys will enjoy this. Awesome. And I have to say, uh, being at this yoga teacher training, meeting all these new people made me realize how proud I am kind of of what we've done at the show and what we've been doing together as consummate athletes, because pretty much every time in teacher training that they'd say like, oh, has anyone had any experience with and like would name a sport or something about, you know, we talked a bunch about pelvic floor and yoga teacher training. There is, you know, much discussion about like running and some cycling. We had some functional strength stuff and pretty much everything that came up, we'd either had a guest on that covered it or you and I have gotten to do it in the past couple of years. So it's pretty exciting getting to see sort of that consummate athlete lifestyle stuff actually really come together in this training. So I'm very excited about everything we're doing and all of the guests we have you know, that we've had and the ones we have coming up, we have a ton of really cool episodes starting, you know, obviously counting this one uh, in the in the hopper right now. Yeah, I was definitely really uh, excited about this one and a couple we have in queue and a couple we have sort of in the works to get books. So as always, if anyone has requests for sports, or movements or have someone back on or you I know someone who's really awesome we'd love to hear from you and yeah we're having a blast so thank you all right let's dive in all right welcome back to the consummate athlete podcast I'm very excited today I, I've convinced Sheila Tarmina to come and Sheila is Sheila T she's written uh, a few books on swimming uh, we've had Tons of requests for swimming, real swimming, you know, how do we swim faster? How do we get swimming? How do we break through plateaus swimming? And when I was getting ready for the Ironman, Sheila's book uh, was just transformative. You know, we've, we've had the total immersion people on and I really like that for just sort of getting my face in the water and getting going, but I definitely hit a, a plateau and when I wanted to get through that Ironman faster and get out of that water as soon as I could, um, her book was just transformative and that was just from reading a book we've never met. Uh, but today we're lucky to have Sheila on. And so Sheila, welcome to the podcast. 
Hi, Peter. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah. And now you're you're coming out just soon here with a, a new version of the book. So we'll we'll certainly link to all that and um, talk about a few of the techniques today. But what I wanted to start with is just sort of how your your sporting career, your own personal sporting career. So before you got into coaching, sort of what that looked like, you know, on the consummate athlete. That's sort of what we're curious about, right? Is what what sort of builds to you know a world class swimmer, you know, over the years and that sort of early development. So so what, how did sport get started for you? Well, I'm the youngest of eight children, and I wanted to do whatever I saw older siblings doing. And so one of my sisters was on the swim team at the YMCA, and I wanted to do that. So about age five or six, I joined the Y, and I was really just in pure swimming all the way through college and even a few years past college. And um, I'm small. I'm about five foot two and a half, and um, I was always a, a pretty good swimmer in the sense that you know, at high school state meets, I'd make the finals and, uh, I didn't win anything in high school at the state level until my senior year. Um, but then, uh, that got just enough attention to where a couple colleges said, Oh, you know, maybe we'd recruit you. And I wanted to go to the big time swimming colleges back then. This was in 87 and they were Stanford, Florida, Texas, um, and there's still great swimming schools today. But back then, they were the three biggies, and um, I wasn't fast enough for any of them to bring me in on a recruiting trip. Um, but kind of the next tier of schools down uh, was interested, and so I ended up at University of Georgia, which, thank goodness, back then, you know, 30 years ago, they weren't the program that they are today. It's actually the same coaches who are there today, but now Georgia is one of the powerhouse teams, and they um, have won seven NCAA championships since the year 2000. And uh, in Rio 2016, they put seven swimmers on the Olympic team. That's just U.S. swimmers, um, not even including their international swimmers. And so I'm thankful that I got to be a part of the Georgia program before they built up to this great powerhouse and, and swim with the coaches there. So really, I, I spent 21 years swimming and uh, made my first Olympic team at age 27. And I thought I would never do sport again after that. That was a long time to be in sport and getting up early. And, um, but after a couple of years of not doing anything, um, I, I ended up hearing about triathlon and I felt like I, I hadn't done any exercise in two years since the 96 Olympics, um, that I swam in. And so like a lot of people, I just picked up triathlon as a way to kind of get healthy and it looked exciting. Um, but I met a gentleman in that sport, uh, Lou Kidder, who, who thought I had potential in that. And so I started training with Lou and his wife, who unfortunately passed away about a year ago. Uh, she was killed on her bicycle. But they were uh, my coaches, my training partners, and ended up just falling in love with triathlon and uh, going to two Olympics in that because of uh, his great coaching. And um, And then people think I'm crazy, and I'd never planned the final sport that I did. I I was finished with triathlon at age 35, thought I'd be done altogether just with sports. I was tired. and um, But somebody approached me from pentathlon and said, put the thought in my ear that, hey, do you know that no woman has ever gone to the Olympics in three sports before? And we think if you came to pentathlon with your swim and run, you could pick up the other sports in, in that multi-sport event and uh, possibly make the Olympic team. And so you know, I look back on those years and think, what was I, what was I thinking that I did that? But I'm thankful I did. <laughs> I, I ended up um, competing in the pentathlon in the Beijing Olympics. And uh, that was the end of my sporting career, which is hard to believe that that was 10 years ago. So uh, that's kind of a recap of a complicated sport career. And I have to apologize. I did not know the last part of that story. Like you are, you know, I've had you on, and I think I said it when we were talking beforehand, I had you on as a sport expert, but you are indeed, a, you know, with the pentathlon, that is definitely qualified you as a, a consummate athlete. Oh, well, thanks. So we are talking about equestrian show jumping today, right? Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> your I, other, I, your I other hobby. <laughs> <laughs> I don't no, even... I'm just sticking with swimming. That's the one I know. That swimming's the sport that was in all three of those uh, Olympic sports that I did. Okay. So it's the common thread. So pentathlon involves swimming? It does, yeah. In the oh. pool. It's a 200-meter freestyle in the pool. Wow. I did not. For some reason, that didn't click. Does the decathlon involve swimming? No, not the decathlon. No. Oh. Uh, pentathlon's got five sports, 
and it, the decathlon is all track and field events. Yeah. So they run, running, throwing, jumping. Pentathlon is based um, on the skills actually that a 19th century cavalry soldier would need during wartime. Uh, skills they would need to either fight the enemy or escape the enemy. And that's been in the Olympics since 1912, believe it or not. Um, it, the founder of the modern Olympic Games is a Frenchman named Pierre de Coubertin, and he wanted to showcase the skills of the ultimate cavalry soldier. So the five sports um, are the, the, the ones that would, would simulate uh, fighting, the, the skills that you would need are pistol shooting and fencing. And then the skills, the other three sports are means of escape during those cavalry days, and that's swimming and running and horse equest- equestrian jumping. So got a very interesting neat history i am tongue-tied and i feel so ignorant that i did not know that and we're gonna have to i'll maybe hit you up because you probably have great contacts we may even just have to have you back on to talk about pentathlon um now i just feel completely derailed and like this is we we have dropped the ball not having pentathlon (laughs) on before that is amazing um so let's let's stick with swimming though (laughs) i've made i've made a note i'll bug i'll bug you i'll bug you later about that um, okay. so, so I'm wondering for swimming, uh, you mentioned your size. So do you feel like that was a disadvantage or an advantage coming through swimming? Like, is that, it sounded like it was small for a swimmer if I read that right. So is it right. small? Is that a disadvantage or is there ways to play off of that? That people would say that small, um, you know, for a swimmer to be five, two and a half. And I do feel small when I'm on the land, I'd, I'd feel small, like behind the starting blocks and, but when I'm in the water, I don't feel small at all. And so that was the one place I couldn't notice anybody's size difference, um, literally, not even in the slightest. So I believe uh, water doesn't care about a swimmer's height one bit. Um, and, you know, when we get to talking about swimming technique, it, it's how well you navigate the propulsive phases of the swimming stroke. And that's what moves you forward in the water. It's not like this reach that everybody thinks you have to have. So I just became a affectionado when it came to the propulsive mechanics of the stroke, which, in other words, it's more like the, the underwater pole facets of the stroke. And I felt like I could move my body forward through that propulsive action just as well as anybody else could move their body forward. Yeah, that makes, it's definitely very common that you see that, you know, it's the the size of your, you know, the vessel length and stuff. Um, But I guess that, you know, it's probably, it would make sense that, you know, if you have less width or just over girth, for lack of a better term, that the length, you know, is proportional to that somewhat does does that make sense? Like it, it's, it's not just ultimate absolute length, right? Yeah, sure. You know, and, and you're right. I, I hear that like the length of the vessel would be you know, a longer vessel would go more quickly through the water. But then I say, well, yeah, but you're right. They, they have more mass to pull through the water and, and resistance. Um, but the, the main reason why I felt I could compete was that, you know, I'd, I'd say, okay, if all things are equal, and, uh, you know, that we have the same work ethic, uh, that I have the same work ethic and toughness and strength and smarts and strategy. And I'm committed to training as much as everybody else. And our mechanics are all dialed in. If all things equal in that sense, then um, the taller person might get me. But I always knew never are all things equal. And um, so, you know, if, if there was, and I don't even know how I would quantify this, but if there was a disadvantage, it would be so very slight, you know, for the shorter swimmer that it's easily made up for in other arenas, being tougher, more committed, you know, that kind of thing, um, better mechanics, uh, better mental attitude. So that that's how I always approached it and never felt at a disadvantage. Okay. And then you mentioned also that you, you didn't win till later in your, your high school career, at least. Um, do you think that that was, you know, beneficial as far as your long-term development, having to not, you know, not have that early win? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I uh, never had the pressure, I guess. I was, like I said, I did have success in the sense that I was a good swimmer and I'd, I'd score points and make finals. And uh, But I was never the star that had all the pressure on me. So, yeah, and and I guess, you know, Ultimately, it led me to University of Georgia, where the the coaches there are just class act guys, Jack Bowerly and Harvey Humphreys, and they their program and the culture there was just a perfect fit for me. Um, you know, they welcomed athletes who they saw had potential, 
And so, you know, our life path, we never know how we're, what road we're going to go down necessarily. I'm just thankful for how I managed to stumble along and find all these great coaches. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you never could plan that. I'm just not going to win for the first 10 years of my, my career or whatever it is, right? Like you can't, you're not going to not win if, if it's there. Um, but I think it is that, that balance, right? Of like a little bit of success, you can sort of have it, but like you say, not so much that you get sort of caught up in, you know, doing interviews after every thing when you're in high school or whatever. Yeah, absolutely right. And then the other I, thing I thought was uh, interesting was you mentioned going to the university that weren't like in the peak universities. And I'm seeing that more and more that, you know, people make the decision or, you know, the, the decision semi made for them and they end up going to sort of those whatever tier two or the, you know, not their first choice. And then it ends up being, you know, they get to play more or they get to, um, you know, just better opportunities, you know, really one-on-one experience or like this hidden coach who's, you know, really good and just, you know, there isn't a ton of resources or something, right? But they have really good coaching. Um, I wonder, is that something that like people when you're, when they're making decisions now, like, have you given advice like that to, you know, not be so bummed that you don't have, you're not going to Stanford or the, the best, you know, NCC, uh, school? Well, you know, I think that's individual for each person and what I try and advise young athletes who are in that situation uh, to consider is you have all good choices. You know, don't feel like, don't feel the pressure of, oh boy, you know, am I going to make the best choice? Am I going to do the right one? You know, you look at all these selections before you and they're all great. If I could have gone to Stanford, if I could have gone to Florida, Texas, Georgia, I probably would have you know, love my experience anywhere. So um, not to be fearful of the decision-making process is the first thing. And then, um, but when you do have to make a decision, that can be difficult. And I guess I just really connected with the two coaches, Jack and Harvey at Georgia on a personal level. I knew that they cared about not just my swimming, but I could just sense that they were these people who wanted you to develop as a human being. And they even, the way they treated my mother and father when, when we went down for, you know, the freshman orientation um, and just things like that, like the culture was what I wanted. And so my slogan always has been a happy athlete is a fast athlete and make sure that emotionally you're going to be happy where you are, uh, whatever defines that for you. Um, for me, being emotionally happy meant being with coaches who cared about me as Sheila and not, not just how I swam. Um, I think that's great. I think that's a great answer for anyone, you know, with kids going to school or, you know, I think even just your, your quote about not being fearful of the decisions, they're all, you know, good or, or there are decisions, there are choices to be made. Um, and, and often, you know, the, the actual choice is not that big of a deal, especially when you're going to, you know, great schools otherwise. Um, yeah. Okay, let's move into swimming a bit more specifically now. One of the the big things I liked about sort of your philosophy, or at least your book, um, was this concept that a lot of swimmers and a lot of swim coaching instruction, you know, manuals and stuff, will deal with uh, everything. Like, they'll try and work on everything at once, um, which which makes it very hard to make progress on, you know, the specific things that are going to lead to, you know, more speed or, or better form. So... Can you touch on that a bit more? Like what are, what are the errors around this like lack of minimalism, if, if I can call it that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, swimming's a complex sport. It's got many components to it and everything will have some impact on performance. But my thinking, and, and since I also had to learn sports in, the, in pentathlon from scratch, because I had never been on a horse and, you know, we had to jump four feet jumps or four foot jumps and fencing is a complex sport as well. I had to identify, okay, what do you tackle? Because there's many things in those sports that you could be coached on too. And so when I wrote my, my book, when I write my books, I look at it from the view of what are the vital elements And by vital elements, I draw from uh, the Pareto principle, which is also known as the 80-20 rule. And essentially, it states that in all of the things you could work on, you know, there's there's a very small percentage of things that have a a huge impact. So about 20% of the things you could address give you about 80% of the impact of your performance. And so those few things are your vital elements, and you cannot neglect them. 
so as an athlete training to learn new sports, I always sought like to find out what are the vital elements in equestrian show jumping and what are the vital elements in fencing and in swimming. When I went to write my book, I said, okay, so many people are working on elements of the stroke that have diminishing returns that just no hardly any impact or, or they won't have any impact if at first you don't develop the vital elements. And so I really wanted to direct readers to toward those vital elements. And so I don't say that you shouldn't work on all the other things. I just say, let's organize the information and, and make sure we address the vital elements in the proper amounts and then the lesser, vit- lesser vital elements in their proper amounts. Um, so that, I try to give athletes focus, you know, in their practice too, because I think a lot of people go to the pool and they're like, what am I supposed to even work on here? I don't even know if I'm getting better. And I want them to leave every session feeling like they became better. Yeah. Do you think your other sporting experiences, especially the pentathlon, do you think that, like, is that is that what motivated this update to the book with the new techniques, some new techniques, some new drills and this sort of thing? Like, is that... Is that what's really motivated this this update to Swim Speed Secrets? Uh, the update to Swim Speed Secrets, this new edition that's just literally come off the press this week, it, it was was primarily that um, I wanted to photograph the most recent Olympic swimmers uh, for one thing, but I'd also discovered a few concepts I call deal breakers, and I I'd learned over the years of coaching that, oh, wow, people could be doing the propulsive aspects of the pole, the mechanics of it quite well. But if they're missing these two critical uh, things that I've identified um, in the stroke, and, and it's not really mechanical necessarily, it's, it's, we can get into them if you want, but um, if they're missing those, it can diminish their, their um, mechanics greatly, the effectiveness of their mechanics. And so I said, I have to get these two huge concepts out there um, that have never really been addressed much in the swimming world. Um, one of them hasn't been addressed ever. And uh, the other one's just kind of brushed over. So um, that was the main motivation for, for the new edition. Uh, but also, I, I, I'm on the front lines all over the world doing swimming clinics, and I'm hearing the rumors that are out there. And I oftentimes hear rumors that make me feel unsettled. Um, so one of the things in the underwater poll is people are telling athletes to pull straight back. And I understand the history and the science of why that rumor has gotten out, but it is such a false rumor. And uh, I said, oh, my goodness, we have got to address this thoroughly and keep people from following that advice and also get coaches to stop using those semantics um, in their coaching. So there was, there was a hefty uh, number of reasons why I wanted to do the new edition of the book. Awesome. And can you tell us like, what are, you know, I, I, when I went to the pool for my stuff, you know, it was very, I just wanted to learn how to swim. That was my main goal. So once I sort of figured that I was like, okay, now I just need to get out of the water so I can ride my bike. That's what I enjoy doing. So at this triathlon, I just really wanted to, if I could get through the swim, I knew that the Ironman wasn't really going to be that big of a deal, but it was a big deal that I didn't drown. Um, (laughs) so your book was helpful with that. And what I liked about it is that there wasn't a ton of, like, I just, when I went into the pool, one of the things that I just had no interest in was the equipment and the props and swimming around with like foam things in between my legs. And so I, if I read your minimals and stuff, there isn't a ton of this sort of stuff in your, your general philosophy. Um, and I'm sure you use some of this, you know, all in, in its place and for certain things. Um, but as sort of the general starter, there wasn't like a ton of instantaneous you know, kickboards, fins, all this stuff. Yeah. I'm a fan of kicking and using kickboards and whatnot, but things, things like fins and paddles, I always felt like the swimmer, you know, a lot of times swimmers are using those as a, cr- as a crutch to try and keep up with people in their lane instead of feeling like they could learn the more elite stroking techniques. My firm belief is that elite stroking is within everybody's grasp. Um, it's just, I, I, in my new book also, what I want to do is put the onus on the coaches, the coaches in this country, because what we've tended to do as coaches is look at a swimmer who's new. Maybe they come to the sport at age 45 and, you know, they, they, they need to learn from scratch. Essentially. It sounds like, you know, you came into it almost that in that sense. And if you don't, um, improve 
you know, down to a certain pace, uh, when, when a coach just tells you some simple stuff like, hey, pull straight back or kick from the hips or keep your head down, what the coaching community has tended to do is say, well, you know, Peter just started too late. Uh, he's behind the curve or uh, Peter just doesn't have a feel for the water. And we, we've sort of blamed the athlete why they get stuck at sort of a slower speed. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. This needs to be placed on the coaches. If, if we can't get an athlete to get down to a certain pace per 100 um, yards, we, we, it's our fault as coaches. So I really started seeking out what are we doing incorrectly as coaches? We cannot be blaming the athlete anymore that they started too late or don't have a feel for the water. So uh, that's really my passion because I see how much hard work athletes are willing to put into the, to the, you know, sport. And so I say, okay, let's teach you what a real swimmer does and let's throw away all the crutches uh, that, that coaches just say, okay, well, you can't keep up. So here, throw on fins. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm going to teach you uh, being a, a real swimmer here. And then we'll put on fins when it's appropriate. Once you know how to navigate the mechanical aspects of the stroke properly, now, if we put on fins, we get a great power workout, a great strength workout from those. But I don't want you using fins as a help, help you keep up in the lane kind of a tool. So, and now in open water, that might be different for safety if you needed someone to keep up in a group when they're in an open water. But I'm talking about in a pool practice. Yeah, and I think the the danger in, you know, reading someone's book or a blog post or worse is a tweet or something like that where, you know, it's not that you're saying never do this or if you're using it, you're you're – you know, not doing the right thing. It's that you're sort of boiling it down to the couple things that you see work with the people that you are working with, right? And where the, the biggest bang for your buck or the, you know, the first steps, the ordering even of some of these things is sometimes the issue, right? Like you might yeah. very well benefit, you know, in your, as a very experienced swimmer, like maybe it's good for you to use, you know, hand paddles or whatever. But for me, you know, it may be not the right thing, right? It might overload my shoulder muscles, which are used to cycling and not having much much use and it might ruin any chance of getting that sort of feel for the water. Right. Yeah. Cause I just, like I said, I just see a lot of people saying, okay, my end goal is to keep up with the guy in the lane next to me. And you know, I can't do that unless I throw paddles and fins and a pole boy on or what, you know, whatever. They do. And he used all these tools and I'm like, Hey, take a couple steps back be willing to invest, you know, a few weeks, months, maybe a season in finding out the true mechanics of the sport and uh, then build into it from there. So I as much um, enjoy trying to get people to sort of uh, enjoy the process uh, more than anything and, and put aside this, this frenzied rush. To, oh, I got to hurry up and do this all now, because to me, that just brings unhealthy stress to the whole learning process. And I mean, I guess if you, if you're the consummate athlete, you want to enjoy what you're out there doing. This is supposed to be our leisure time in a sense and our health and fitness. And so if we put a rushed anxiety type stress and frustrating type stress on our bodies and minds, that's just doing none of us any good. And I, and I know the feeling because of having to learn those sports for pentathlon. I, and I was doing it with, okay, hey, the 2008 Olympics do have a deadline here. I better learn how to ride a horse, <laughs> you know, over a four foot jump. And I better learn it quickly. And uh, it, it was taxing on me emotionally. And so I think my books and my whole coaching philosophy comes a lot from that perspective of wanting people to not have unhealthy stress with it all. Yeah. And, and trying to, you know, minimize, I guess is the word we're using, but minimize the things that someone who's coming new to it needs to focus on or learn, right? Because all those, the kickboards and stuff like that's all a new skill really to learn, right? So to me, it just felt so much easier to just boil it down to like, I just need to swim across this pool and not, you know, stop swimming. It would be, it was the first goal, and then, <laughs> right? And then be smooth with it. And then, you know, maybe the speed or the consistency or, you know, the breathing for me was a big thing to just learn as well, right? So, okay, I got across the pool once, you know, and I was able to breathe. And then when that wasn't a challenge, then it was, you know, swimming for a, a little longer or, or whatever, um, and, and to me, yeah, that's that, right. And that's where a lot of people are coming into swimming, right? So I think if you get right into like a master's swim where it's immediately we have to keep up and there's competition and people are going by you on all sides, it gets really overwhelming for a beginner, right? I think triathletes are the most brave people. The one, and I'm talking about mainly the ones who didn't come from a swimming background. 
they take on this challenge and they get in an open water situation with hundreds of people and, and in a lake or an ocean where you can't touch the bottom, I have such an utmost respect for the bravery and the spirit that they have to do this. Um, it, I just love it. It's my favorite part of triathlon. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty intimidating, actually. Like, it was a, it was a good challenge. Like I say, the Iron Man itself didn't scare me, which sounds odd, but the it was just I just had to get out of the water and get through that, and then I knew it was fine. I just had to move the rest of the day. But, um, yeah. yeah, it's and it's funny. I actually ended up enjoying the swim part the most. It was a little hectic, but to me it was just like a bike race. Like, you were just sort of jumping on, trying to draft people, going around people, you know, little bit of rubbing and stuff but it, it wasn't really that bad um so i actually had, i actually had a great time like i would go do that on a weekend um <laughs> we, we did it in whistler so it was quite scenic and r- luckily the weather was nice and stuff too so that definitely helped if it was freezing you know and, and everything else and i don't know if i would enjoy it and the water was pretty calm but yeah, yeah. You know, all those things make a difference definitely you know we we all can be tough at certain points if the weather stinks or the water's freezing but for the most part we need pretty good conditions <laughs> yeah. at least i do i'm a full weather athlete yeah and i mean in that concept you know you've done these couple sports three, three sports these few sports at you know quite a high level um and so you sort of focus and i think that's with this consummate athlete or just you know general athletics you know even if you're focusing on a sport there sort of comes with phases right this is periodization or you know, certain goals that we're going at this year or this four years or this month. Um, I wonder if you can speak to a bit, you know, with this minimalism of swimming, you know, if we're coming in, you know, our first few, let's, let's say I'm swimming and I'm doing, you know, an okay pace. I'm an okay swimmer. Um, can you speak to, you know, what a, a focus or, you know, what the couple techniques might be, you know, if I'm a moderate, you know, I can do master swim, but I'm definitely not the fastest. Um, like what would, what would that sort of minimalism approach to swimming look like as far as drills or focus or, or how I spend the time? Like I'm, I'm coming, jumping in the water. Like, what are we doing? Yeah. And, you know, and I coach clinics around that exact question. Um, that's my main career and and my book of course, as well addresses that. So uh, as I said, in my book, I really focus on the underwater pole path because If you want your body to move forward, the only way that you can move forward is by your limb, your, your hand, your, your arms and hands. And then of course your legs, your feet, if you, if you want to be a kicker, but most triathletes are, you know, not excited about kicking. Um, So let's just go to the pole and and say, okay, you know, you're you're going to be pulling. Um, You've got to focus on, on how you generate a distance per stroke. When your arm pulls through that water, how does it transfer into moving your body forward? And if, if you think of the water beneath us where, where we're pulling, it's three-dimensional. You've got a, a fore-aft component to it, a vertical component, and a lateral component to it. So we have this three-dimensional medium and then we got this arm that's down there pulling through that. And we've got a wrist joint, an elbow joint, a shoulder joint. And I joke and happily say in, in my new book that the variety of strokes I see at my clinics, you know, never ceases to bring a, a happiness to my heart. I just love all the things that people are doing down there in the third dimension. But fluid dynamics and physics are not so tolerant and they demand more measured actions. And so my, I guess the word you're using is minimalist and and I use the word, the vital elements, but we're talking about the same thing. My approach to that is focus down there in what I call the third dimension, the, the deep blue down there where your arm is pulling and get that pull path dialed in. Um, that'll give you more bang for your buck than, than anything. And I think people work, you know, are so focused on things like head position and body position. Um, you know, head position, I, I say, okay, really keep your neck neutral. Okay, done. We're done with that conversation. There's nothing more to talk about it. That, that's why that's not a, a vital element because it's just not complex. You know, keeping your neck neutral is not a complex concept. Um, body position, my take on that, because a lot of people get hyper-focused and worried about that. I say if you generate propulsion with your stroking arms, your body position, you'll just like a speedboat, you know, when you press on the throttle, 
the speedboat rises up and cruises across the lake. And the minute you take the power off the throttle, you know, the speedboat sinks down and settles, you know, lower in the water. So I'm like, let's generate propulsion and you're going to find your body position really exactly where you want to be. So that's how I approach it. Just, just keep your focus on that underwater pole. And, and I take the photos of Olympic champions to show the mechanical movements down there. And um, it's not anything that somebody can't do with, with a, some concentrated effort. Um, so it's, it's a complex thing in the sense that, okay, you, you have, a, you know, from the catch to the mid phase of the stroke to the finish, um, you've got to be, you know, doing spe- specific things, but it's, there's details to it, but it's uh, not, not this like infinite number of details. There's a set number of details and attend to those and I think you'll be pretty happy. And, and the the big aha moment for me was really sort of the the I guess high elbow and you can correct me on the how I'm describing this but the high elbow with the the focus the real I guess aha moment was it wasn't just my hand like I was so focused on reaching and grabbing with like my hand like I was grabbing a rock and I was so focused on the rock that I wasn't thinking about using my forearm and my entire arm really um, as sort of my paddle right I was thinking about the end of the paddle or or grabbing something and pulling myself forward. And so when I started doing that, um, it, it was just mind blowing, like instantaneous change. And, you know, I took a bit of time to get the the technique and the sort of pattern. And then also just the, I think maybe a bit of muscular sort of strength, but can you speak a bit just to that, that concept? Cause I think that's huge. I think for a lot of people, that's going to be huge. Yeah. Yeah. The, the high elbow is also referred to as the catch I know, or somebody may have heard it called the early vertical forearm. And it's after your arm enters the water and it extends forward. Um, when, when you extend your arm forward in the water, it's, it's facing down on the water. And when, what we need to do as swimmers is, is uh, get our arm to face back on the water because we need to take a mass of water that's on our limb and we want to take that mass of water and accelerate it backwards. And when we accelerate or throw the water backwards behind us, we get thrust forward. It, it's sort of like a jet engine propulsion. So the high elbow is really the the positioning from this down facing hand and forearm to a back facing hand and forearm and there's a couple of unique things that have to take place because this is all happening overhead and which is what really makes it unique and we think oh it's just in front of us but you know because we're laid horizontally in the water but if if you were to take a swimmer and position them vertically you know, you'd see that this whole catch and extension is all happening overhead. So that makes it a little more challenging. And so it, swimmers can't take it for granted. Like you said, you know, you just didn't get it instantly. You have to work on it for a while because it's a bit awkward. It's awkward, but very doable. And um, so the forearm, like the engagement of it, since, since we're taking a mass of water and throwing it back, you want to take as big of a mass of water as you possibly can and throw it back. That's how you'll get more thrust. So when, if you just have a mass of water on your palm and your hand, you'll get some forward propulsion. But if you can add the surface area of your forearm to that, I think studies have shown that it adds about 27% more propulsion to the stroke. So in engaging that forearm is really critical um, in the stroking motion. Uh, if you If you wanna get faster, you know, and really, start to enjoy unique, sophisticated movements, which I will always say, as I've already said again and again, it is doable, doable, doable. And I love teaching it. And I love it when I see other coaches who can teach it too. Yeah. And I think there's two things that I thought came from that. I was starting, you know, the volume was coming up a little, I was pretty, I guess not to overuse minimal, but my, my triathlon training, like I didn't do a ton of hours, but you know, I'm in, again, I'm a cyclist and my arms going overhead repeatedly. So I was starting to get a little bit of, you know, shoulder pain, you know, just some niggles there. And I was sort of getting a little nervous about that. So I think that's partially how I actually found you was, you know, you, you have this position and, and I found that just changing to that position sort of, it shortened the lever, which makes sense. The arm, you know, wasn't at that super long distance out reaching and then I'm pushing down um, overhead. And then right. also, I think maybe, you know, you're able to use a bit more of your or your arm musculature maybe too. Um, so there's like a position sort of aspect too. So I could see someone, you know, if they're having shoulder pain, have always struggled, you know, reviewing some of these concepts 
um, might be helpful. Have you found that, you know, you have people at your clinics or something who have always struggled and then, you know, maybe a little correction helps with that sort of overuse, you know, swimmer shoulder? Absolutely. The best news of all is that the mechanics that make you fastest, you know, the ones we see the Olympic gold medalists using are also the healthiest mechanics. Um, for your shoulders that uh, I never had a shoulder injury in all the years that I trained uh, because I was a mechanics freak and paid attention to every detail. So there's, you know, maybe five areas of the stroke, the arm stroking motion. And and that includes some of the overwater portion too, like the recovery where I've identified you could get a shoulder injury. The, The most common mistakes I see that would probably cover 97% of swimmers with shoulder injuries um, are probably doing it in any one of these five areas and definitely that area where you were finding it, you know, out front, but, you know, pressing down, uh, and not getting the catch done properly. That's one of the areas. Um, so if, if we can, as a coaching community, identify all those and have them on our radar, we should be having a whole crew of healthy swimmers out there or throughout the world, enjoying the sport and not having to sit out because of inflammation. And that's in your book, the few few areas you've sort of identified? Well, the, the all of the stroking mechanics that are in the book are ones that should keep you healthy. I've only mentioned maybe two of them, I think two of the areas, as saying, hey, if, if you feel your shoulder's hurting here, it could be because you're doing this or that. I didn't name all five of them. Gotcha. Um, something I should probably do is a little blog post thing. Yeah, I mean, like um, you say, so- it, you can always check someone's stroke using those techniques, too. Um, yeah. and I guess the other thing that that sort of helps correct is, you know, the classic cyclist thing, at least, um, it, it is usually that the, their legs sink. And so if you think about this stroke, so rather than putting your arms straight in front of you and pushing down on the water, that makes sense that your legs are sinking, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You so, got it. So that stroke then often doesn't just make you faster or your shoulder not hurt, but it often corrects this. You know, we're all trying to do the streamline, you know, keep everything straight as long as you can, but then your legs are still sinking and it's like, right. Right. So, so I think that's another, like where that length isn't necessarily the cure all, right? Like it's not just, you know, always, you know, you take, it can be taken too far, I guess. Right. Well, and that exactly. And that's where I was feeling uneasy as I was just a, observer as an athlete, you know, when I competed, I was an observer and hearing things and saying, Oh no, I'm pretty sure that's not how you want to get someone to do the stroke. And and so I became fascinated with, boy, could I write uh, something where I could address some of the things that make me worry for people out there, that they're hearing misinformation. Um, And, you know, it's just swimming in a sense. So it's not like we're saving you know, having to operate on a, a baby's heart or anything here and save a life. But it still was important to me because people were putting a lot of time, energy and money into the sport. And, um, and yeah, it's so easy for them to, to look at a concept and get it wrong or like misunderstand it. Or we just have to do a better job with our semantics and how we're communicating things as a coaching community. Nice. That's great. And so the other thing that's sort of related to that, but another thing that a sort of interested me with your book and again i think this is what it sort of attracted me your book just sort of seemed to like check all the boxes i was looking for at this point um was the sort of out of water the dry land uh stuff you have as well because it's that was one of my least favorite things about the pool uh is that i had to you know often drive we live in the country so to get to the pool you know and the hours are usually early or really late and you're driving you know to get there so it's like there's got to be a way to practice a little bit, you know, think about this, you know, you can certainly visualize, but how do I get better at swimming or stronger at swimming uh, without necessarily being in the pool all the time? Uh, So you have a couple band exercises uh, and also a device. Can you just sort of briefly, I know it's hard sort of in this, we'll certainly link to your YouTube uh, videos as well. Uh, But can you talk a bit about the sort of just basic band exercise that you have people do? Yeah, it's one of the huge features of my clinic is the halo tubing. And uh, some people have probably heard of the halo bench. You can lay on a bench when you do it as well. But if you don't have a bench, you can just pull on the tubing and it uh, simulates the underwater pull. Um, I don't, I'm don't. i going to be 49 years old uh, on March 18th. And I started doing tubing at age 15. So 
So this was a long time ago. I started doing it. I don't know why I started doing it. I can't remember a coach uh, telling me to do it. My parents certainly never did, but I had a set of tubing in my bedroom. And before I went to bed at night, I would pull on it like three times 50 repetitions. And I tell people, I, I honestly believe the tubing was the competitive advantage. What put me on the Olympic that I was a contender to be on the Olympic team George, towards my later years, not when I was 15 years old, but um, because I did tubing throughout my entire athletic career, right on through to the Beijing 08 Olympics, I, I think I was a contender who made the Olympic team four times versus uh, being a contender who just missed the Olympic team. That's how much I believe in the, in the halo tubing. And I don't get paid one penny by them to say that it's just something I started on my own at age 15 have always done it. And the benefits of it are multiple. First of all, when we are trying to work on the underwater pole path, like I said, it's complex because of the three dimensions down there and and the wrist elbow and shoulder joints. So sometimes when people get in water, that can be overwhelming for them. So the tubing can be done on land and you can really dial in the mechanics on land. So when I do my clinics, that's what I do with the, with this halo tubing, get people to make sure they dial in that technique. Um, number two is that you might be able to do that technique really well for 25 yards or 50 yards, but what happens 800 yards into your Ironman? You, you know, you might not be able to hold those positions if you haven't trained enough or you don't have the right muscle tone and endurance. So the tubing is the most ideal like muscle endurance training um, that you can do. It, it puts the perfect amount of tone and endurance into your muscles for swimming stroke. Cause we don't need a ton of brute strength in swimming. We just need to have this endurance to repeat these motions stroke after stroke after stroke for hundreds or thousands of yards. Um, so those are two, two benefits. I mean, I can name a whole bunch more benefits, but those are, those are alone are enough. And the, the beautiful thing about the tubing is that, for adults who can't always make it to the pool, like you said, if you have a too, too long of a drive or people with families and jobs just gets in the way or they travel, um, you can do it at home. And a 10 or 15 minute workout is just incredible for what, what it can substitute if you can't make it to the pool. So I still do it today, even though I haven't competed in 10 years. I do it just to feel like a swimmer still. And um, it's my favorite training tool. And I tell people, I'm not saying, you know, don't do a weightlifting program, but try and add tubing to your weightlifting program. And it's like 30 bucks and it fits in a, it can fit in your purse, you know, yeah. not that you carry a purse, Peter, but oh, it's really easy to it. <laughs> I always joke that my job is really just carrying Molly's bags around on her travels and stuff like that. So, um, uh, you know, that's really good. We we're big advocates of sort of a anywhere core, I call it, or just sort of a daily core routine. So we try and get all my coaching clients, you know, doing like 10 minutes and some of them do more, some of them do less. But, you know, it seems like 10 minutes every day is a good buy in. And as as adults, we all have, you know, that shoulder that's pesky or those ankles that are always, you know, we've had some stress fractures. So we have physio exercises we're supposed to do. Um, so, I mean, this fits really nicely, you know, I, I don't think even if you're not a swimmer, you probably benefit from just getting your arms overhead and doing a bit of pulling. And, you know, there's a, it, like you say, like the, the mechanics are, are such that they should keep shoulders healthy. Um, so that, that's great. We'll definitely yeah. link to that. Cause it is, I, I was going to get you to describe it, but I think it's better. We just, you know, check out the show notes and we'll get, you can check out the, the basic technique, uh, of the tubing that you've described here. Yeah. And, and the guy from Halo, he and I are going to refresh the videos. I mean, everything that's on those videos is accurate, but it, it definitely, I look very young. I should maybe keep those, but I, we need to just refresh them and I can give a few extra details that maybe I didn't know to talk about back when we, the videos that are on there, um, maybe we're done, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. So it's the same technique I've always used since I've been 15, but, um, now I, I just think I could talk about it in a way that would help people, um, be able to, then transfer it into their own training routine. So, cause the key is doing it correctly. You, you don't want to do it incorrectly. Awesome. Yeah. We'll link to that. And, and definitely if you get those out, let us know. And we'll certainly sort of help you circulate those, uh, once those do get reshot. Great. 
Um, so now I have a greedy question. I, you know, we'll, we'll call it, I, I sort of sliced this out of my training uh, and, and decided it wasn't vital, but I didn't ever really go down the path of kick turns too much. Um, so mm -hmm. I just got to the end of the pool and flipped myself around and I got decent at just flipping myself around, but I didn't partially because I came into swimming with a bit of just like, I didn't like putting my face in the water, uh, had some bad chlorine reaction when I was younger and stuff. So just wasn't super and I was just like, I'm just not going to have to do this in the Ironman. So I'm just not going to do it. Um, so if you were going to, you know, help me out with this, what would be like the first thing you would have me do? to learn to kick turn like just the first drill keep it simple what what's the the first thing the first step first thing is the, to give it the correct name because if you want to sound like a swimmer swimmer you're gonna call it a flip turn but Fair i do enough. know they call it a, a kick well, turn so we have two questions we <laughs> ask we always ask how can we practice this if we're not at the place so we've gotten that and then we always say how do we not look oh. stupid on the first day so you've just knocked that one out so we're gonna do flip turns <laughs> So now is the name helpful in, you know, maybe I, I overthink the kick by calling it a kick turn and less about the flip. Is that, is that true? Or, or like, what, what direction are you going to take me? I'm here facing the wall. What are we going to do? So you're, 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 you're wanting to know the first, um, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you that the hand. So the one big tip will be your hands when you're coming into the wall, stroking your, your lat, what you're doing freestyle, correct? So one hand is in front of you and one hand's finished by your hip. And, and this is your last stroke into the wall. So what you've got to do is take the hand that, that was in front of you, the, the, that hit the water at the last moment before your turn, and you've got to bring that back to your hip where the other hand is. So both hands are going to be at your hips, but there's a big but here when that that's the moment before you actually start rotating and, and doing the turn. So both hands are at your hips, but when you then commence the turn and you start, you know, getting your hips out of the water to flip, your hands need to stay not at your hips because your hips are leaving. Now your hips, your hips are rotating toward the wall. Your hands need to stay in that same point in space in the water where they were when they were at your hips, if that makes sense. Because in other words, your head is now going to rotate and come around to your hands. So the biggest mistake I see people make is they keep, they don't know what to do with their hands. So their, their hands end up windmilling down there or the hands end up getting stuck to the hips. And so once they complete the rotation of the turn, their hands are down at their sides near their hips and they've got to get them all the way up you know, over their head for the streamlined push off. So the, the biggest trick is if you look at video of swimmers doing it, study how their hands um, s s stay in that same spot. When, once you commence the actual rotational action of the turn, wherever your hands were in the water, they stay in the water there and they actually press on the water to help you even rotate quicker so that you can, you can do the turn quickly. So that, does that make sense? It's, that makes a lot of sense. Of I'm definitely a flailer and probably that's why I like end up kicking and like I'm kicking into the other lane because I've rotated like, you know, 90 degrees. So now I like kick, you know, the, the, uh, into the other lane basically beside me. I miss the wall completely. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, I'm sure the guy loves that in the lane next to you. He's like, yeah, hey, no. cool. Yeah, we usually go in quiet time so that there's no fights or disagreements like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, that's good. What about my, so my other thing is with that, I don't want to dwell on this too much because this is super greedy, but there's probably a lot of people that don't know how to flip turn. Um, what about breathing and stuff? How do you think about that? Like, is that a, you know, to avoid water up your nose, you know, that sort of thing is what's the, can you, do you know the thought process for that? It's probably been a long time since you've had to deal with that. So you mean how, how are you actually like when you turn the head to breathe or how often a lot of people ask how often they oh, should I, breathe. And, and I'm uh, thinking in the flip turn. Cause that's like when you end up with like, I'm fine. Oh. I'm fine just in freestyle breathing. But when I go face first into the water, I end up like ending with water in my nose. Oh, so you're saying like when you're actually rotating around and so you're, you're upside down for a moment when you're in the flip turn exactly. um, phase. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you have to just blow air out your nose. Um, just, the whole time while you're flipping. Yeah, yeah. Any time that you're actually, especially when you're upside down in that water, and it, it only happens, you know, for less than a second if you had a good rotation. Yeah. So well, it's not a sense, long amount I, of time. I do do that, and that's helpful. Like when you're just swimming, right? You just gradually let the bubbles come out. Is that sort of what you're saying? It's the same thing as when you're just sort of swimming freestyle. 
Yeah, you don't have, yeah, and you don't have to forcefully blow anything out. It's just like that little kind of almost like a humming, you know, in a way. You could, you could even hum just to, just so the water doesn't go up your nose, just right. have some kind of pressure coming out there, or air right. coming out. Yeah. That's an awesome idea. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Hopefully that I'll have to report back how that goes there, our remote consultation there. There you go. And just because you're really greedy about the slip turning stuff, I'm, I'll give you one other thing that uh, you, will help you is that proprioception and kind of knowing where your limbs and everything are in space, even when you can't see them, is really important during a flip turn. So you need to know where your feet and your hips and your head are. When you, when you do that flip turn, your feet are going to come over the water, of course, but then when they come back in the water to plant on the wall, you know, for the push off, you want them to plant, you know, a foot, maybe a foot and a half deep in the water. And cause your hips should be that foot to foot and a half deep as well. And your head needs to be that foot to foot and a half deep. So feet, hips, and head all need to end up at the exact same depth. I'll just say a foot to a foot and a half deep. Once your feet plant on the wall, you know, before you actually push off to swim the next length. So proprioceptively just try and think of head, hips, and feet at the clamped moment. Yeah. I have to think, um, that, that'll be helpful. I, uh, you know, I have decent awareness, but I definitely just didn't do it, you know, in this name of vital stuff. I don't know if that was good or bad. It probably slowed down my times in the pool, but, um, or it did slow down my times in the pool, but I think the hips coming out of the water and then just sort of leaving the hands where they are, I, I think will, will make a lot of sense. There's a lot of other sort of skills that I can do out of the pool that are, are not dissimilar. You know, I'm decent at tumbling and stuff like this. So, um, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Um, so okay. for the, for the more serious swimmers then, is there, you know, we, we haven't talked much about the actual training, the actual sort of intervals and stuff. Is there, you know, if someone was looking to sort of break through for their swimming, is there anything as far as like sets or anything like that? I know it's, you know, most of your book is not necessarily about sets as much as technique, but is there anything like what's your go-to swim workout? So I don't list any workouts in the new edition of uh, Swim Speed Secrets, but I do uh, really get into rate of turnover in this book, and that has everything to do with your training. Um, in, in swimming, it's quite it's the opposite of running when we when we think of how we change speed. When when we run, we we pretty much keep the same tempo. You know, our, our turnover is going to be very similar whether we're going slow, easy, you know, or whether we're going fast, 10K pace, let's say. What changes in running when you want to go from slow to fast is your stride length. You know, you, you'll have very short strides when you're going easy. And then as you pick up your speed, your stride length is what changes. Well, swimming is the opposite of that. In swimming, we want to keep our stroke length pretty much consistent and the same. It changes very little, just like stride um, just like stride tempo will change little in, a little bit in running. But for the most part, those stay pretty static. And what changes in swimming is our rate of turnover. And in the new book, I list that I, I introduce a whole new concept that I've always coached by, which is the gear system, that I feel that there's about seven gears in swimming. And each one of those are related to a rate of turnover. In other words, how quickly your arms are turning over in the water. And so um, an elite swimmer, when they swim easy warm up, they'll be taking a full stroke. And that's from like when an arm hits the water and you do a full revolution and that same arm hits the water again in the same spot, that's one full stroke. It'll take them two to two and a half seconds to do that full stroke. But when they're sprinting a 50 freestyle, you know, 20 second race, they're going to be turning over at a rate that's quicker than one second. So more, more than twice as fast a rate of turnover. And then there's all these gears in between. And so I really go into detail explaining in this book um, how you could use the gear system in your training and how we should design a whole bunch of different sets around various gears. Because a lot of just lap swimmers, fitness swimmers, or, or triathletes will tend to get stuck in one gear all the time. And really you know, slow. Paid- That's what's, I got a bit of coaching. We have a great coach here, Rich Patey. I don't know if you know that name or not, but in the triathlon sort of side, but he comes from a swimming background. And that was, he was like, that was what we worked on in basically all our sessions. Once I sort of got swimming, uh, was getting that turnover up. You, you, you have to, and, and of course the thing that's got to be on your mind when you go to ratchet to faster 
rates of turnover, you have to keep your distance per stroke. You know, you, 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 you don't want to flail your arms and then not travel forward on every stroke because some people will rush everything. So you, you still have to keep the integrity of the stroke, which is, okay, every stroke I take, I do need to move forward a certain degree, and then I build rate of turnover into that. It, it's kind of like cycling, you know, your gear system, right? If you, if, if you want to go into a, a tougher gear, um, you know, the, the, the cycling, mechan- the, the actual technology and components do all the ratios for you. But, you, you know, if you're going to keep your same RPMs on the bike and go into a harder gear, you're going to have to put a lot more energy and force into it. And same with swimming. The faster the gears that you have, you know, you're going to have to, if you keep your distance per stroke, you're going to be using more energy to do that. Yeah. And that's a so definitely in cycling. That's a, there's sort of this, it, it's similar, but different, but the similar, if you had someone spinning super, super fast, but going really slow, it looks really, really odd. And and that's common. You'll have people with like a muscular limiter or they just don't want to feel that like muscular tension in their hip um, or they're getting really, really tired right. muscularly. And so you'll see that like spinning, just easiest gear, but like on a flat and not moving. Um, right. Right. And so it's almost like there's like just an empty space there. Like, Hey man, connect. You want to feel that connection. Right. And the connection being, like you said, you want to feel it in your, your muscles that are going through your hips, your glute, you know, you want those muscles to engage and, um, they somehow manage, I think, to not engage certain muscles when they do that. Right. You're exactly. Coach, like, yeah. There's coach. nothing like they're touching nothing. Right. Like they're not pushing down on the pedals. Um, and, and this was really a big concept too. I mean, like I say, it was almost instantaneous, but it was over a few sessions, but between that high elbow grabbing with more of my arm and then just turning over faster, again, if we think about, you know, it, it power output on a bicycle, but you know, how fast we're going swimming, you know, if we can keep that stride length the same or similar and then do it more then we should swim faster. Right? Yes, absolutely. Exactly. Yep. And I do have a book called Swim Speed Workouts that is um, 48 workouts. It's a, it's a, oh my gosh, 16 week program. <laughs> I have to think. Yeah. Cause three, three workouts per week over 16 weeks equals, equals 48 workouts in there. And it's, it, it does dive into a little bit of rate of turnover at some of the workouts. And we, and also I address the mechanics of the stroke. So um, I, I do have workouts and they're not in the new edition of Swim Speed Secrets, but I have a book that addresses just workouts called Swim Speed Workouts. But you do talk so. about the turnover and the sort of cadence idea uh, in the new book. Yep. In the new book, yeah, I really explain okay. how you, you, if you're designing your own sets, you know, Cause that how could, you that can. That could be just an, if you're an experienced swimmer, you've been doing a lap swimming for a lot while, that might be just change your focus to your, your cadence, your turnover uh, might be, you know, really refreshing, right? Yes, absolutely. Sometimes and, and it's doing, yeah, the new focus, right? Yeah, because I tell people you should enjoy some twenty fives. Like one one day in workout, go ahead, do your long endurance stuff. But another day, you should go and do a light warm up. I don't know, maybe five hundred, eight hundred yard warm up, and then just hammer out twenty times twenty five in a really fast gear. Take tons of rest, all the rest you need, and then get the heck out of there. You know, warm down at two hundred and go home. Yeah, and that'll do a lot for you. Hundred percent. That's what I definitely in the last two or three months of my Ironman prep, we did. You know, we do not full. Like I was getting fast enough that in, you know, it would take under an hour and a half to do full distance, which isn't amazing. But again, I wasn't. Uh, uh, what are we saying? Flip turning. Um, but <laughs> there you uh, go. We'd usually do like, I just sort of go for like an hour basically and for distance, right? And just distance swim and just make sure that that distance kept coming up each week and, you know, just at that casual, comfortable pace and fairly steady. But then the other two or three of the week were 30 or 45 minutes where I was doing, you know, 50s and 100s and maybe a couple 200s or something working on turnover and just speed, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what you want to do. You want to mix it up like that. And what I think happens, and maybe there's a disconnect in the endurance cycling world, but those like high intensity workouts or high cadence workouts or or what have you, like that transfers over often to that endurance, right? Where you can sort of maintain that little higher turnover, that little higher speed. And that's just your casual pace now, right? Absolutely. I mean, that was my favorite rides when I was in triathlon, you know, going where I knew a group of guys got together like, you know, every Wednesday night, let's say, and it was just a hammer fest for like an hour and 15 minutes and people would attack and then you'd settle in. But I just loved the, that type of training and uh, it does amazing things for your endurance. 
Yes, for sure. All right. Well, I've kept you for an hour. That was packed. Um, and yeah, I'll have to hit you back up for some pentathlon, you know, people or, or maybe just have you back on once you get through all this book. Hectic time. Um, but Sheila, thank you for coming on. We'll certainly link to the book, the new book, the couple books we mentioned. We'll m- m- link to the YouTube. Um, and then your website is SheilaT.com. And you got it. Yeah, and then Swim Speed Secrets is on Facebook as well, which we'll link to. And the new book is Swim Speed Secrets for Swimmers and Triathlons, or Triathletes. Um, So that's awesome. Did I miss anything there or any other way people can connect or like your clinic information is on the website? Um, You know, Velo Press has a great website with all the books, but you named everything there. And then I would, the only other thing I'd remind is just the the Swim Speed Secrets is a second edition is what you'd want to get. It just has really, really got more... um, updated photos and everything it's really fun super so all i right. don't even think the first is in print anymore so <laughs> all right well we'll try and we'll make sure all those links go through but i think like you say off of amazon or something like that i imagine no that's sort of automatically done got it well thanks peter for having me awesome well best of luck with the book and clinics and stuff as you get going here again for the the season Hey guys, before you go, we just wanted to have one quick word from our sponsor, Health IQ. Health IQ is a life insurance company that helps the consummate athlete, like you, save money on your life insurance. To find out more, you can check out healthiq.com slash C-A-P-O-D, that's C-A-P-O-D, for all the details and to take a free quiz. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Consummate Athlete Podcast. To check out all of the show notes for this show, go to consummateathlete.com. And to follow along with our various adventures on the social medias, you can check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash consummateathlete or follow me, Molly Herford, at Molly J. Herford on Twitter and Instagram. And I am at Peter Glassford on Twitter and Instagram. And if you could do us a huge favor and rate and review the podcast over on iTunes, that helps us bring on more guests, you know, get more episodes out and do more cool stuff. So we would be forever grateful. And if you're looking for coaching for endurance sport or just for health and wellness, uh, you can check out smartathlete.ca. And for amazing outdoor content, you can check out theoutdooredit.com. Aw, honey. And that's theoutdooredit.com for Molly Herford's writing and all things outdoors. All right. Thank you so much for listening, guys, and we'll see you next time.